All right, well today we're going to be, of course, continuing with our series through the Ten Commandments, and we land on the Fourth Commandment, which is, of course, as we've already seen and heard, the commandment about keeping the Sabbath, which I think is a little bit of... I think sometimes Christians don't quite know what to do with it. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we'll be reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments. And it's in verses 8 through 11. But I'm also going to read the version of the commandment as it comes up in Deuteronomy chapter 5. You may or may not know that the commandments are listed twice in the Bible. And they are mostly all the same in terms of wording and things like that. But there's an interesting difference in the way the fourth commandment, the commandment on the Sabbath, is given to Moses when he's up on Mount Sinai versus the way Moses explains the commandment when the children of Israel are about to enter into the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy. So I'm going to read Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11 and I'm also going to read Deuteronomy 5 verses 12 to 15. So before we do that, let's pray together and ask God to bless his word. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we know that you are in this place. God, we know that you created all things and that you created time with rhythms, rhythms of work and rest. God, we pray that you would give us more insight into how you have ordained the time in our lives. As we look to your word, we pray that you speak to us. God, be with the words that I say and the meditations of all of our hearts as they fall upon our ears, that the thoughts in our minds would be pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So in Exodus 20, we read, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter or your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And if we switch over to the Deuteronomy account, we have Moses reminding the children of Israel of the commandments that God gave. And we read, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was watching a documentary recently on Netflix entitled Minimalism. And I found it there, and, and the film talks about the sort of rapid consumer economic uh, Western culture that we live in, and it focuses on a group of people who call themselves minimalists, who try to live sort of in opposition to this fast consumer economic society in the West. And one of the things I found very kind of striking, fascinating, incredible, hard to believe in the documentary was that for example, the fashion industries now follow this rule of thumb called fast fashion, where fashion cycles go through 
52 seasons in a year. That means the fashion season is a weekly basis. I mean, it used to be there were maybe like four or six seasons in the year, depending on how much the weather changed, probably. But now uh, clothing retailers want it to be so every week there's a new fashion to display, to advertise, and to sell. Which means, incidentally, that most of my wardrobe is probably at least 200 fashion seasons behind. But they do say that things come back into fashion, so once in a while I'm probably right on. But what this film Minimalism captures is that Western culture is just driven by the hunt. And our society is completely restless. So whether we're chasing paychecks or trying to grow a a successful business or whatever that may be on the one hand, or whether we're trying to sort of entertain ourselves to the point of distraction and chasing a wormhole of whatever our smart device can give us on the other hand, it doesn't matter. We are consumed by the hunt and it never rests. Our work is powered by caffeine, our leisure is powered by alcohol, and our lives go from stress to sloth. And sloth is not real rest. We live in a society that is driven by the hunt and never finds rest. And so we enter the fourth commandment. Observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy. On it you shall not do any work. And I think, and maybe you would agree with me, I think that this commandment always poses a little bit of a challenge for Christians. Because on the one hand, it's part of the Ten Commandments, which is like the backbone of moral teaching in the Scriptures. So we know it must be important. But on the other hand, we're Christians, and we also look to the New Testament, and we find Jesus seeming to go against the pattern of the Ten Commandments. At least he's frequently accused of this. For example, he'll heal someone on the Sabbath. And when he, gets, uh, when, he, when he takes heat for this, he basically says, what's right, to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? To not help this person would be to do evil. So I'm doing right. But Jesus seems to go against the Sabbath as it's prescribed in the Old Testament. And for another thing, Christians, as you might know, we usually observe Sabbath on Sunday, whereas Old Testament Israel and the Jewish people today would observe Sabbath on Saturday. So are we automatically breaking the commandment on that regard? How does it still apply to our lives if we are following it on Sunday? And should we observe a Sabbath day at all? After all, the Apostle Paul, if you followed his writing, says in Colossians, don't let anyone judge you about observing a Sabbath. These things are a shadow of the things that were to come, but the reality is found in Jesus Christ. So does that mean we shouldn't be observing any day at all? Do we only have nine commandments that we have to follow, and the tenth one is somehow fulfilled in Jesus to the point where it no longer has any bearing on our lives? And I bet we could probably go around the room and say, each one of us, what we think or how we have observed the Sabbath commandment being applied to Christian life, and we would probably get a whole diversity of answers right in this room. And in fact, there's been a diversity of interpretations throughout the Christian church. At some times in places, there has been this idea that the Sabbath commandment just points to Sunday for Christians. So you follow it on Sunday. We avoid as much work as possible on Sunday. Back in the day, in some places probably still today, 
Christian Reformed people had a specific reputation for how they observed and applied rules on Sunday. Now, before you think I'm casting mud, remember I am CRC. I am here as one unnaturally born, grafted into your midst, and I appreciate your hospitality. But back in the day, when there were communities where there were the Christian Reformed kids and the Reformed kids, one of the big things that plainly divided them was that the Reformed kids could play baseball on Sunday, and the Christian Reformed kids could not. So that's one interpretation that we have seen in the church at various times and places. Apply Sabbath regulations to Sunday. And some others have suggested that, well, maybe the day doesn't matter. Maybe the specific day, that Saturday, that was a ceremonial law for ancient Israel. But for us, we have to follow the pattern that Exodus and Deuteronomy gives us, which is six days on, one day off. And you have to choose the day that works in your schedule or, or your lifestyle. For example, it's very frequent for ministers to take a midweek day off. And it's also pretty frequent for ministers to refer to that day as their Sabbath. So that's another option. But there are other Christians who will go even a few steps farther and say when it comes to the fourth commandment about observing Sabbath and keeping it holy, the day, it's not about a day. Forget about a day. Jesus inaugurated a new era. He released us from sin and death, and what we live into each and every day is the sort of Sabbath rest that Jesus invites us into, which is true, but is that the whole picture of how we observe the Sabbath day today? Is that all that the Sabbath commandment is about, or does it actually have something to do with our weekly rhythms still today. John Calvin, because I know you're interested in what he said, if you've heard of John Calvin, emphasized the social justice aspect of the commandment. We find that especially in the Deuteronomy version that I just read about giving everybody rest meticulously. So he said the ongoing application is not just, yeah, we worship, but this Sabbath commandment reminds us to treat other people fairly, especially if you have employees or workers or household servants, whatever it might be. The Sabbath commandment is one that pushes us towards social justice and treating pe people equally and giving them all the day off. And since I... Oh, okay, hold on. I have to take a little field trip. I would be remiss if I left the Heidelberg Catechism out of our investigation of the Ten Commandments because it gives a nice exposition of each of the commandments. And the Heidelberg Catechism seems to do a little bit of a both and. It says, yes, a specific day of the week, but yes, also an ongoing reality that Christ inaugurated that we live into right now. Question 103. What is God's will for you in the fourth commandment? First, that the gospel ministry and education for it be maintained, especially on the festive day of rest. That's referring to Sunday. We attend the assembly of God's people. We learn what God's word teaches. We participate in the sacraments, which we'll do uh, this morning as well with the Lord's Supper. We pray to God publicly and we bring Christian offerings for the poor. And second, the fourth commandment teaches that every day of my life, I rest from my evil ways and let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit. And so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. So there's kind of a, a both and application in the Heidelberg Catechism. So I'm not going to tell you at this point, or by the end, 
exactly how you need to apply Sabbath and the fourth commandment to your life. I I do think there are good principles, and I do think the Sabbath commandment is one that has maybe frequently been sort of overlooked or ignored in terms of its significance for our lives. But I'll, I'll hit on some of those principles closer to the end. But first I want to focus on what we might have noticed as we read two accounts of the commandment, and that is the subtle differences between the Exodus account and the Deuteronomy account. And the difference is basically this. They give different rationales for following the commandment. And I think each rationale is valid and meaningful and deepens our understanding and appreciation of what Sabbath is and what it means to keep Sabbath in our lives. So let's take Exodus first. The commandment says, remember the Sabbath day because, here's the rationale, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So in Exodus, the rationale goes right back to creation order. Somehow in creation itself, there is this rhythm of work and rest that that God infused into the way things are or the way things should be. And the first character to observe Sabbath in the Bible is God himself. We find this in Genesis 2. After the six days of creation, it says... By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So God institutes Sabbath into the order of the universe. And there's a very, <clears throat> excuse me, a very interesting further explanation of what exactly God observes or does when he rests on the seventh day that we find in Exodus 31, verse 17, which is talking about the same event when God rests on the seventh day. And the text says, God speaking, the Sabbath will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed, which is a remarkable word to say about God, that somehow after six days of creation, he needed to be refreshed. Like it doesn't comport that well with our categories of God and and God's unchanging nature, but it does illustrate something about the way we are created. If creation works this way, and we are made in the image of God, then observing Sabbath is in keeping with how we are created. It's following the created order as God established it in the universe. In the Old Testament mindset, order is always the antithesis of chaos. So if you work in keeping with God's created order, Your life has order and consistency and rhythm. And if you work opposed to it, in this case, don't follow Sabbath, your life ends up in chaos because it's how God made us and it's how God made the world. If you work, work, work and are never refreshed by keeping Sabbath, you wind up being a depleted version of yourself. And our consumer economy loves for us to be depleted versions of ourselves. Because depleted versions of ourselves, depleted people are good consumers. We consume television, we try to fill ourselves by shopping, 
We entertain ourselves numb through the bottomless wormhole of whatever our social uh, networking, mobile devices can give us, depending on your generation. We're consumed by the hunt because we're depleted. But Sabbath offers us something different. It says creation works a certain way. You're a creature. You work and you rest well. You rest and you work well. Resting well doesn't mean sleeping the day away or kicking back and having a cocktail on the back porch. There's nothing wrong with appropriate leisure, but the Sabbath commandment highlights a deeper need that each one of us has. Putting aside normal work and normal entertainment and observing time that God blesses as holy. So it can't just be Sabbath to me means treat yourself. Do your favorite thing. Treat your desire to self-gratify. God has to be at the center of it. Sabbath means spending time in worship and refusing to be driven by the need to self-gratify. And so I think we see in this regard, Sabbath, the practice of Sabbath, is dramatically countercultural. Walter Brueggemann defines it as refusing to be defined by our productive work. How easy is it to be defined by whatever our productive work is? Sabbath is work stoppage. It's a visible and public declaration of faith. Even though I could make more money today, or I could accomplish more today, I won't because that won't define me. Or even though I could spend all morning in bed, all afternoon drinking margaritas, all evening watching TV, I won't because my own desire to self-gratify won't define me. And if I'm always on the hunt, I will never be refreshed. Following Sabbath is saying no to a world that says work, 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 and then treat yourself. It's saying, no, I'm going to rest in God. And a world that says, work, 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 is a good entry point into the second rationale that we find, and that's the rationale as we find it in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, the wording says this, after observe the Sabbath, so on and so forth, for remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So here, instead of appealing to the dynamic of creation order, it's built into the universe, what we find is an appeal based on redemption. You don't live a restless life or force other people to live restless lives because God took you out of a restless existence and into his rest. And that's what you extend in practicing Sabbath. It goes back to God's work of redemption. There was no rest for the children of Israel in Egypt. It was all about quotas making more bricks, doing more for Pharaoh who worked them to the bone. And God draws them out of that context into his rest. So this overflows into the sort of social justice dynamic of it. You don't work others to the bone, your children, your servants, for goodness sakes, even your animals. Because God took you from slavery and into rest and you have to let others rest too. You have to remember that your whole life begins with the grace of God. And you extend that to others. In fact, what we find is that this Sabbath principle even extends beyond this 
six days on, seven days off kind of system for ancient Israel. And the way God prescribes it, they're supposed to do six years on. Six years of planting and harvesting. And then on the seventh year, God says, remember, the land is mine. Don't work the land. Let the land rest. What comes up, what grows, you can eat. But don't plant and don't harvest. You let the land rest. And then after seven cycles of seven years, if you've looked into the Old Testament, you know that there's this sort of extreme year of celebration and release called a jubilee where not only do you let the land rest, but you also free all the the servants can go free, the slaves can go free. If you have had to sell off land because your family came onto hard times, the year of jubilee uh, uh, orders that the land is given back to you. The year of jubilee and this Sabbath principle demands that the community is not subservient to the economy. But community comes first. So you can't monopolize the farms because Jubilee winds up, Jubilee comes around, and all the land has to go back to the original family owner. And you can't crush people with crushing, chronic, endless debt because the jubilee comes around and debts are canceled. Which is why Walter Brueggemann says this Sabbath principle is maybe the most dangerous principle in the Bible because it is so completely opposite of our consumer economy where economy is above community. God turns that around for ancient Israel, and that's the redemptive vision of a Sabbath principle working out into an economics of justice and equality for the people. But the problem is, we have no evidence that the people of Israel ever came through and actually observed Sabbath in terms of the Sabbath principle of years as God ordained it. Never do we read, in the twelfth year of King Zedekiah, the nation came to its year of jubilee and all the captives were freed and and all the land was returned to its original owner and and the land was allowed to rest. Israel didn't really come through on following this because they didn't want to set aside their means of production, their pattern of securing their lives on their own effort, of defining themselves by their productive work. We never find that in the Old Testament. In fact, this is interesting. One of the reasons God gives for ultimately exiling his people from Jerusalem into exile for 70 years, one of the reasons God gives is, you never let my land rest, and it deserves its 70 years of rest. So the city is crushed, and the people are taken into captivity for 70 years before they can come back to live in Jerusalem. The people of Israel failed in the sort of economics of justice as God prescribed it. So enter Jesus in Luke chapter 4. It's the Sabbath day. He's in his hometown of Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue. He stands up, this rabbi. He takes the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and Jesus reads... The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the year of the Lord's favor is understood to be a reference to the year of Jubilee. So Jesus steps in and announces Jubilee, freedom from captivity for God's people. And then he says to the people who stand around him, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
Jesus inaugurates a greater and deeper jubilee than could have ever been practiced by ancient Israel. Because the greatest story of redemption is our redemption from sin. And Jesus announces that jubilee when debts are canceled, when slaves go free, but it's for all God's people, regardless of nationality, regardless of the millennium that we were born in. So we've covered a lot of biblical ground, a lot of the scope of this and what Sabbath entails in the Old Testament, how it's fulfilled in the New Testament. Where does it leave us when we sit and look at the Ten Commandments? We've noticed a few things in the process of our survey, and I think we can kind of draw some of them together. One thing is the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment, is kind of a bridge. It's a bridge between the first three commandments, which are about honoring and directing ourselves to God. It looks back at those and follows in suit by saying, honor the, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, kind of remembering that consecrated nature of it, that this is a way we honor God. But then it's a bridge forward to the following five commandments, which are about loving others well. Now you remember, next week we're going to have father and mother, and then murder, adultery, stealing, false witness against your neighbor, covered, coveting. That's treatment of other people. And the Sabbath points that direction by also maintaining that sort of let other people have the day off. Ensure that everybody gets work. Make sure the Sabbath is a day of equality. And to observe the Sabbath, we stop our normal work and intentionally focus on God. But observing Sabbath also means intentionally looking for ways in which we can be compassionate towards other people. Maybe the clearest way we can do that in Sunday worship, as we often observe Sabbath in our lives is through our, our givings of offerings, particularly, for example, next week for world relief. But Sabbath also, the Sabbath commandment invites us to unplug and to refresh. And chasing a 52-cycle annual fashion year won't give you that opportunity. And cycling down the bottomless wormhole of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram feeds, hoping that that little red or blue notification circle will pop up, that won't bring you refreshment. And following your sports teams or meticulously keeping track of whatever entertainment you are after, that kind of hunt won't bring you refreshment. But we worship a God who says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Keeping Sabbath means stopping our normal work, but it also means stopping our normal entertainment and letting God reorient us to our identity in Christ. If we rest well, we can work well, and God will bless, empower, and refresh us in it. And Sabbath observance is right at the center of that. But Sabbath also has, we've already seen it a little bit, a future orientation. Hebrews 4 promises that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, looking forward to the future age. So practicing Sabbath for us in our lives, in our rhythms, is not just a remembrance and a celebration of what Christ has done. It's also a preview, a celebrative preview of what is yet to come in the age to come. And there's an old rabbinic story that nails this on the head. The ancient rabbis, Jewish rabbis, would, they would tell stories where they kind of added to Scripture. They would 
fall between the lines of the stories that were actually there. And the purpose was always to sort of explain deeper nuances or levels for the listeners. So there's this old rabbinic story that goes like this. God is talking to his people Israel after he gives them the law at Mount Sinai, after he gives them the, the, the Torah, the law. And God tells them, he says to the people, if you keep my Torah, I will give you for all eternity a thing most precious. And the people say, what is this thing? And God says, this thing is the world to come. And they're dazzled and they say, Lord God, give us an example of the world to come in this world. And God says, the Sabbath is an example of the world to come. That's New Testament theology. And that's Christian theology. And that's the Sabbath commandment. So I, I won't tell you exactly how you need to observe it. But God does invite you today into the blessings of observing it. To combat the chaos that otherwise surfaces in your life as you know too well. To celebrate the redemption that God extends to you in Jesus Christ. To trust in God. To rest in God. To stop worrying. Isn't that a tempting invitation? To let go of trying to secure your life through your own work and efforts. If you're a child of God, you belong to him and he secures you. Stop trying to do it yourself. Friends, trust in God and rest in his provision. This morning he invites you to know true, refreshing Sabbath rest. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you help us to remember and help us to cherish what you have done for us. Lord, help us to consecrate time in our lives to worship you. Help us to put aside both our needs to gain wealth and our need to be entertained and instead to be refreshed in your presence, to be renewed for your service. Lord God, you have made us and we are yours. And we know that we are restless until we rest in you. God, help us to find all our hope, all our security, and all our rest, not in the little that our hands have done, but in all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.